Hello everyone and welcome to this new gen webinar entitled Protein Therapeutics Understanding the Biophysical Characterization Toolbox. This webinar was made possible through sponsorship from Structure Matters and Redshift Bio. I'll be your host today. I'm Jeff Pugliscus, Technical Editor at GEM, which for over 40 years has been the leading source of information on the latest tools and technologies that support the life sciences industry. Now, having the right tools for protein characterization has always presented a particular challenge to researchers. There's no one biophysical tool that answers all the essential research questions about a biologic drug candidate or biomolecule. So investigators are forced to use a huge array of techniques to understand and identify essential attributes such as thermal stability, protein structure, size, and aggregation. But even with these techniques, questions still remain, such as which tools are orthogonal and are any measurements more essential than others? And is there one technique to rule them all? And on today's webinar, we're going to hear from a panel of scientists who'll discuss the interplay of these techniques from the biophysical toolbox and how those tools are implemented in their research and how they decide which technologies to utilize and under what conditions. Now, before we get the webinar underway, I'll remind the audience that we will have our Q&A session immediately following today's presentation. So if you have a question about today's topic or for our panelists, you can go ahead and type your question into the ask a question box and hit submit. And you can do this at any time during the presentation today. You don't have to wait until the end. So if a thought pops into your head, a question about the topic, go ahead and type it in and then hit submit. We're going to try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Now, I'm going to turn things over to our speakers and specifically our moderator for today's panel, Dr. David Sloan, Vice President of Product Management and Applications at Redshift Bio, who will kick things off and then will be introduced to all of our panelists. Dave, over to you. Hello, everybody. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to the panelists as well as our viewing audience. My name is Dave Sloan, and I'm the Vice President of Product Management and Applications at Redshift Bio. I'll be the moderator for today's panel discussion. I'd like to thank everybody for participating in what I expect will be a great discussion on the importance of biophysical characterizations for proteins and biologic drugs. Today's webinar is sponsored by Structure Matters, which is an educational project founded by Redshift Bio and co-sponsored by a handful of biophysical tools companies. Please let me extend a heartfelt thank you to our panelists who will be participating in this discussion. On this panel, we have scientists from academia, contract development and manufacturing organizations or CDMOs, large biopharmaceutical and the regulatory perspective. Without further ado, I'd like each of the panelists to introduce themselves and to say a few words about how they utilize biophysical characterization in their current roles. Let's kick off with Steve. Hello, my name is Stephen Lebrenz. I am a consultant uh, in the biopharmaceutical development space, specifically in the CMC area. My background is in biophysical chemistry of proteins, and uh, I have 21 years experience in the areas of purification, analytical development, formulation development, and some of the more recent work is high throughput uh, characterization of uh, drug products. My, uh, my background lends us to the expertise that I bring to projects in that what we're looking at is relating typical characterization methods to support uh, validated specification-driven analytical methods. To that end, uh, when we were looking at lot-to-lot -lot variability of drug substance, the big gap that we're facing right now is in this specific area, is in secondary structure analysis, as well as uh, is leads into tertiary structure analysis, and ensuring that if there are changes in manufacturing, that those changes are not deleterious drug substance. Thank you. 
Thank you, Steve. Let's turn it over to Risto. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, my name is Christus Vilinov. I'm an associate professor at Ghent University in Belgium. I did my PhD and postdoc at the two universities in Munich before that. And uh, I would say that my uh, research interest and focus is on therapeutic proteins. So we're on the one hand side interested in developing new molecules and uh, playing around with new formats like uh, these specifics, but also antibodies that have very interesting uh, antigen binding regions. And on the other hand side, we look a lot into the pharmaceutical aspects, for example, uh, which physical chemical properties are important for therapeutic proteins, how we can select for these properties, and how we can very quickly perform formulation development to select uh, optimal excipients for, uh, for a new protein. Um, having that said, biophysical characterization is important for all of our projects. So I don't think that we have a single day in the lab where we don't do some kind of biophysical analysis, including secondary tertiary structure, uh, but also other things about which we can speak later, I think. Um, with this, I, I would like to hand on to the next panelist. Thank you, Risto. Mary? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, I'm Mary Christie. I work at Wasan Consulting Life Sciences, or VCLS for short. I'm a director of CMC um, Biologics with the head of expertise in biosimilars here at VCLS. So um, in, in my group, we provide um, CMC regulatory and technical support to our clients. We help people um, prepare their submissions, get ready for interactions with um, health authorities, both in the US, EU, and in Asia. So kind of all around the world. Um, strategy, kind of anything CMC regulatory um, related, we, we can support with that. Um, and um, yeah, we use, we use um, biophysical characterization in, in our work because of course we need to understand what our clients are doing and what the health authority expectations are. Um, so yeah, that's me, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Catherine? Hi, uh, my name is Katherine Bowers. I work at Fujifilm Dyosynth Biotechnologies. We are a CDMO. A um, little bit about me. Um, I have a, a background in protein folding and biophysical characterization. That's what I did my doctorate in. Um, and also some wonderful experience in mechanistic enzymology. So understanding the chemistry of enzyme reactions. Uh, in my job, over the last 19 years, I really think I have seen so many various proteins um, from small fragments to all the way up to VLPs. The only thing I haven't done yet is gotten into the viral gene therapy space, which I'm just itching to do. So with that variety of protein molecules that we have to look at, um, each protein is different and has a very, very unique personality. Um, so biophysical characterization becomes everything. It's the heart of what we do. Um, you have to be able to look at these molecules from every direction possible at your disposal because uh, getting the information about their personalities sometimes can be like playing a detective. And where some methods for some proteins are like, they they give you a lot of information. It may not be the case for other proteins. Um, so anyway, take home message is that I love biophysical um, characterization of proteins and I love science. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate yeah. that. I I love the analogy of being a detective. That's that's <laughs> that's that's perfect. That's that's superb. And I, I that's really the the whole goal behind the the, the structure matters and this panel discussion that we're talking about today. So to, to kick off with the, first, with the first question, let's go with Mary. Mary, how does protein structural characterization play into your regulatory consulting role, but for everybody else into your research, into your cons consulting, into the work you do with your customers and your clients? So let's, let's kick it off there, Mary. Yeah, sure, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so kind of, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, it's, you know, as a consultant in, in, in my role, I need to be able to understand what methods are commonly used in the industry and what their um, 
what our clients and, and other sponsors are submitting to health authorities in their submissions. Um, and, and, you know, this understanding allows me to better provide technical advice to my clients on what methods are being used and accepted by health authorities, how to interpret their data, maybe they need help with a validation strategy, et cetera, those kinds of things. So it's always important for me to make sure I understand what's kind of state of the art and how people are using it. Great. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate the framework for it. And if we have time later on, we'll maybe touch on how companies could go about introducing new technologies that come on the market as well. Because I think as Catherine said, there's always new technologies and things coming out there. And it's always a challenge for explaining those technologies to the FDA so they know what they're looking at and what, what the strengths and weaknesses are. But we'll, we'll return to that. Catherine, did you want to make a comment or two about structural characterization in your CDMO world? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, structure of protein molecules, honestly, is, is at the heart of everything. So as we know, the amino acid sequence of the protein encodes for everything that molecule needs to know to fold. That structure is related to function. Um, and that structure, even though when we look at crystal structures, it looks like it, they're tough and you know they're they're not um, susceptible to um, anything they look like you know little armored you know chemicals but the reality is is that there are so many stressors that, that protein is going to experience from expression to patient that you have to monitor structure um, not only as it relates to formulation development and safely delivering it to patients but if you think about everything that molecule has to go through in the manufacturing process, in the fill finish process, understanding what's happening to that structure um, is, is absolutely paramount um, to making um, good, good scientific um, decisions um, in your troubleshooting efforts. I, yeah. I, can, I don't think I can say more. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, Catherine. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, I think really when it comes down to it, it, it is all about making informed decisions and understanding where, where the science, where the technology is leading you. But that, that's great. Thank you. Risto? I really like the, the statement that structure is everything because if, if you think about it in a way, we do a lot of different proteins uh, in, in the projects and you know some of them are so exotic they never existed in nature so you really don't know what to expect and then when you go about it it's really starting first with the primary structure really verifying that it is the protein that we would like to have inside based on amino acids and then going into the secondary and tertiary structure analysis where we want to see, is it the fold that we expected or the modifications that we did somehow detrimental to the protein? Did we observe something unexpected, something new? So for me, the structural analysis is, is very basic in, in each of our projects to understand what's going on. And then on the other hand side, understanding how all the extrinsic factors like the formulation, the temperature, how they affect the structure of the protein and its stability and functionality. This is uh, another important aspect. And at the end of the day, a lot of the degradation products, a lot of the stability products that we, uh, the stability issues that we see nowadays, uh, they are due to some structural change and some structural issue. So I think at the end, you can track down every problem and every uh, solution actually back down to, to the structure of a molecule. Thank you, Risto. That's great. I, I'm sure we'll be returning to the topics of formulation and stressors and stability as the talk goes on as well. But I, I appreciate you bringing it in right at the start because it's it's really critical and paramount to what everybody's focusing on. Steve, same question to you. Yeah, it also comes into um, practical development across the whole analytical development space. Current issue that I'm working on is that. Uh, we need to remove the API from the sample to perform uh, 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 analysis for endotoxin because the API interferes with the endotoxin uh, assay. Well, the issue that we're having is that no one understands where our API starts to unfold 
to ensure that the enzymatic degradation we're using will go to completion. So it's simply understanding the secondary structure, the stability of the molecule that actually assists in assay development in other areas of analytical work. Without that knowledge, you're just shooting in the dark. And so what we want to do is, is follow the guidance that we're given and make sound decisions and justify those decisions with that critical data. Great, thank you. Very well said. Now that everyone's had a chance to respond, would anyone like to add anything else or jump in on the bandwagon with what anyone else was saying? Or if not, I'm happy to move along to kind of our next discussion point. Okay, we can move right along. We'll stick with, with structural characterization and then we'll broaden it out a little bit more. So diving in a little deeper on the structural world, when you are utilizing structural characterization tools, what are really the critical questions which you're trying to address? Just to add a little bit more granularity, are you comparing one protein, say under different formulations or stress conditions as, as Risto brought up before, or are you comparing different proteins to each other? Are you really asking, is it similarity between molecules or is the absolute higher order structure what you're interested in? Elaborate with specific examples or things from your research. Whoever wants to start off, please go ahead. So for our work, what we're looking at is we're looking at the absolute structure that um, there may be changes in the characteristics, the CMC uh, specifications of your molecule, but do those changes actually influence the structure of the molecule where the activity is based on the structure? In the absence of that secondary data, um, you're, you're still operating blind and you're at the mercy of the interpretation of individuals. All scientists have different opinions. That's what makes it strong in the scientific area that everyone brings their own opinion to the table. But in the absence of the facts, the data, it's hard to translate changes and their meaning to the molecules that you're developing. Catherine? Uh, yeah, I can jump in. So, um, Dave, all the questions you asked, um, it's yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, structural analysis plays a role in all of those things and even more. Yes, when you're comparing um, a protein in different formulations, um, structural analysis comparison is paramount when they're on stability and making sure that that structure uh, is, is staying intact. Um, but it goes even beyond that. So in some ways, it's easier to understand what makes a protein happy by working backwards and discovering what makes it unhappy. Um, so the ability to really understand, you know, as you put these selective pressures um, on your molecule, either through your solution conditions or the mim you're mimicking a process step, a fill finish step, and in a clinical end use step, is, um, you know, the power of being able to understand, okay, what is that structural perturbation? If I have a degradation product, can I then correlate it? to possibly what's going on. And then I think the coolest thing and something I'd like to talk about maybe in some of the future questions is when you do have degradation products, finding a way to figure out structurally what is going on. Because a lot of times it's just not two native proteins sticking together they are forming these amazing structures and um, to understand how far those structures are away from the native state um, can give you information of, hey, what to stay away from or then how to draw it back into, you know, it's nice low energy uh, folded native state. So hopefully that made sense. Absolutely. Thank you. Much appreciated. I I, I really appreciate the fact that a protein is really more than just a melting temperature or more than just an aggregation temperature. Those are easy parameters to get to, but there's 
a whole lot more behind the scenes in terms of what what causes it to, to melt or aggregate at that particular at that particular temperature or point in time. Risto or Mary, please, who'd like to go next? So um, I will follow up on this, and and I think one very important thing here is that you will never make it with a single technique. I think to answer your questions and to compare your candidates or formulations and so on. And I would like to stress the importance of having these complementary techniques and more importantly, knowing what information you obtain from which technique and how you can interpret it and what is it good for. Because you know, some of the techniques will give you a melting temperature, that's great, but then you should ask yourself, why is it important where I can use it in my projects? Then other techniques might be gold standard, but might have a lot of variation. Then you probably don't want to use it as a routine quality check or in industry environment. And then there will be also other techniques that provide you very robust information that you can also integrate as something that you routinely do to see that, for example, your protein is always the same or that even small changes in the structure really can be trusted and you can really trust that this technique is uh, telling you that. So using a complex toolbox of orthogonal techniques is, is very important for me here. Great, I appreciate that. And I, I hear that all the time as well, that it's really about the small structural changes because antibodies and many biotherapeutics are, are quite stable at some point once they get through their formulation and development, but it's those small pertur perturbations that you really wanna be able to detect and measure and understand what that may or may not mean for the, the future or the um, life cycle for that potential drug. Mary, did you wanna make some comments? Sure, yeah, I absolutely agree with everything that's that's been said by each of my co-panelists here. And um, also wanted to mention that maybe um, you all in the audience can see on the video, but when Risto mentioned that one method can't tell you everything, everyone's eyes lit up in agreement. So um, yeah, I think we were all on board with that statement. Um, but yeah, so um, I, I really resonated with some of the things that um, Steve was saying earlier about how, um, you know, you kind of use um, structural characterization tools um, as part of product development in, in different ways. Um, and it kind of depends on like where you are in the life cycle, what questions you're trying to answer. So, you know, sometimes it's just kind of basic characterization of your molecule um, just to understand what you've got. Um, so you're not really comparing the molecule to anything else. You just want to understand what it looks like. Sometimes you make uh, a change um, and you want to see if that's changed the molecule, right? So you're comparing back to that baseline characterization you, um, data that you have from before. Um, and lots of people already have talked about formulation development. So again, you're comparing it to itself, but like um, after different stressors um, or even just on your regular stability program, kind of the same idea there. Um, and then the other thing is like, of course, with um, biosimilars, you're comparing your product to another product and hopefully they look the same. Um, so yeah, it's, there's lots of different ways to use these tools um, when you're developing products. It just kind of depends on your stage, what you're trying to do, um, what's your target profile for your product, um, that kind of thing. Perfect, thank you. And I appreciate you bringing us back to biosimilars because that is absolutely a really important topic from from all of biophysical characterization, because it really is about matching a, 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 new, a new product or a new biologic to an existing biologic and understanding if it is the same on all sorts of biophysical as well as activity levels. But that, that's great. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the comments. Now let's pivot or maybe take a quite small step back. Instead of focusing down on just structural characterization, if we were to look at biophysical characterization just in the broader picture or in the bigger scope. When, when you guys are looking at or studying a biotherapeutic, let's specifically say for formulation development or for formulation studies, what are some of the most important techniques or parameters that you're looking at and, and why? Also, how do, how do those results or how should those results inform the larger development efforts or where you're going with that particular biologic drug or protein in general? So I can just tell you some of the core techniques that we use in formulation development. 
although certainly not exhaustive and certainly not the end of our journey, um, we're always anxious to add more. But I would say that our 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 workhorses, our our go-to, without a doubt, is subvisible particle analysis um, using membrane imaging. So using the Halo Labs um, ROPTX. Um, it gives you this insight into, uh, you know, how this protein um, is forming degradants as a function of formulation and strain, you know, all kinds of different things. Light scattering, without a doubt, a light scattering, because you want to understand how the proteins are interacting and, and if there are strong interactions, what formulation components can then take you into a realm where you start to induce hard sphere repulsions, which will be beneficial to your formulation. DSC um, for us is a gold standard. I know that TMs are not everything, but there's so much information within DSC analysis that I think sometimes people aren't aware of that it goes way beyond um, DSC. In terms of light scattering, dynamic light scattering, um, and its various ways of interrogating a molecule is incredible. And of course, now with the redshift um, instrument being able to do secondary structural, I mean, really high quality secondary structural analysis, um, I think we're just at the beginning, but I think it's just going to, it's just going to magnify uh, the data that we've already gotten so far and really help us connect the dots. Because Dave, you made a really good point. You can collect a lot of data. So for example, um, one of our first studies that we do on a new protein, and it really doesn't matter what protein it is, is it's called a personality assessment. So you're really looking at how, how the protein is reacting to different solution conditions, is it self-interacting? Um, how is it responding to stressors? So you can collect a ton of information. So if you take every single parameter that is available to you for a given assay, you could be looking at 20, 30 data, different data mini sets that are telling you a story. They don't always talk to each other. So then it comes your job as a detective and as a scientist to figure out what is the stability indicating power of that method, selecting those that are the most stability indicating, and then finding the commonalities. And that set of stability indicating methods will be different for every protein um, because they, they tend to like to be a little cheeky and, um, and you have to, to figure out uh, what their secrets are. So I hope that made sense. Perfect. Yes, I, I, I totally get it. You're painting a very colorful picture about all the different personality indicators for the family of proteins. And I, I think you're also in a very unique position being at at Fuji or being at a CDMO, you get to see a lot of different things over the course of a day, a week, a month, a year. So you probably have a much broader perspective than a lot of other scientists who are deeply focused in one type of molecule or one specific application area. So that, that's great. Really appreciate the kind of the, the bigger picture of it and also naming specific technologies. That's great. You named some very popular ones, some big ones, and they, they absolutely are key to understanding about a protein and how that protein may function. Who would like to come next? I have a follow-up question for Catherine. In your approach for formulation development, do you find that, especially in early, um, early development, you're focusing on high-throughput methods? Because I can imagine you know, you don't want someone running something where a sample takes an hour or two hours, but then you've got like a thousand samples to do, right? It really depends, right? If the data is extremely useful, but it takes time, we're going to invest that time to collect. Like DSC data is not high throughput, it's high quality um, and very information rich. Where we can, uh, we have implemented um, a lot of high throughput 
low volume technologies to assist um, in being able to test a lot of samples under a lot of different conditions. That has been critical um, to our ability to within just a week or two under like build a framework of the personality of a particular molecule and inform us how to go further. So, you know, the the membrane imaging for SVPs, the DLS, um, all the way down to our UV using uh, the Unchained Labs Lunatic, being able to do things on a 96 and 3 to 4 well plate format has been a game changer. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary, did you want to make any additional comments on the, the formulation work? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think from a regulatory perspective, like it's important to, to start, before you even start thinking about what assays, you know, you want to think about your molecule and what you know about it. What are the CQAs? What's the intended mechanism of action? And from there, then, you know, you can build um, a picture of what's important to look at in the formulation. And then from there, figure out which assays to look at. That being said, there are like a standard set that you probably will see in every <laughs> formulation development study. Um, you know, lots of chromatography, because like I was saying earlier, they're, they're easy, they're high throughput, they're, um, you know, you usually don't have to do a lot of tweaking, I think, from one molecule to another. So you can start them up pretty quickly. Um, lots of people look at, you know, size variants, charge variants, um, like Catherine mentions, a visible particles, visible particles. Um, people also look at potency, um, and then they do, you know, the higher order structure stuff like DSC, CD, IR. Um, I don't see that as much in formulation development. Usually it's, it's a little bit more like quick and dirty with chromatography and potency um, and, and particle data, or at least that's what I see in the submissions, um, especially for clinical phase when people are kind of starting out. Yeah, so that's that's what I've seen. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Dave, can I can I make a comment to what Mary had said? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Just because I feel like I can't hold it in. Um, I yes, uh, chromatography techniques are simple and they're high throughput. Um, and I see a lot of people doing formulation development based off of uh, SEC data. Um, but I always want people to remember the caveats of running SEC, which includes taking the protein out of that formulation into a mobile phase, um, potential filtering of any higher order structure that's happening, as well as sample dilution. So you could have two proteins, a bunch of constructs, a bunch of formulations, and the SEC data will look identical. But if you pull back the mask and you look at these proteins by other methods, just start with light scattering or even um, SVP analysis, the story totally looks different. Um, so where I don't discount SEC as being gold standard, we do it, it's important. Just don't rely on that solely. That's, I just had to say that. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I totally agree. Um, before coming to VCLS, I worked at FDA and, and there we saw a number of examples where people just got really weird SEC data and we we're like, have you checked AUC? And and then like the story unravels, right? So yeah, it's every every method and we've kind of talked to, touched on this earlier in various ways. Every method has its caveats, its artifacts and things um, that you have to keep in mind. And um, and like you've been saying, Catherine, you're the detective, right? Like you have to figure out when the, when the data don't match up and they're not consistent, what does it really mean? Um, and not just take the data for face value, but yeah, absolutely agree with you. Um, SCC has its place, um, but so do other methods, right? Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Risto or Steve, please. So I, I heard about DSC and AUC and I, uh, I I just have to say a few words here because uh, coming from academia, these are probably some of my most favorite techniques. 
Uh, the reason for that is that you can do a lot of things with the same device. If you think about AUC, you can do sedimentation velocity, so you can separate molecules. You can determine uh, to some extent the shape of the molecule. You can do equilibrium experiments, look at the mass and so on and so on. However, it's a very slow method. Uh, that's why we use it only for specific applications. That's why what is very interesting, I think, to us is how we can use other methods that are faster to obtain more information, because I think we are not using a lot of the analytical equipment, especially the new equipment, to the full of its potential. And I think a lot can come from combining new analytical methods and hardware with, let's say, different types of stress or with different type of measurement principles just by uh, stressing the samples, or I don't know, we have worked a lot on uh, refolding from denaturants and things like that, that are, you know, just other ways to use the device, but provide you a lot of orthogonal information uh, about your samples and proteins. So I'm, I'm a big fan of these robust methods that are workhorses in the lab and that you can use for many things. Ritzo, can I, can I make a suggestion? Of course. <laughs> Um, one thing that we're, we're going to, we, we do not do AUC, but it definitely is something that's in, in our future plan in the next couple of years. Um, one technique that I would encourage you to look into is batch multi-angle light scattering, also called composition gradient multi-angle light scattering, where you basically uh, measure the light scattering um, at a series of protein concentrations. And what you end up seeing um, is, uh, is an apparent molecular weight because you have multiple species in solution, but it's how that molecular, apparent molecular weight changes as a function of protein concentration that will tell you, are you forming higher order structure? You can fit the data and get an estimation of what those higher order species are, the dimers, trimers, octomers, <laughs> it gets crazy. Um, but then you can also uh, just, just look at how attractive and how repulsive um, those interactions are. And you can do it at high concentration um, where there's limitations in um, diffusion interaction parameter analysis by DLS, um, CG malls, there isn't that concentration um, limitation. So um, I encourage you. And if you want to talk more, uh, I would love it. I would be happy to. Do you use it in uh, in your projects or? Uh... Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. Would, not, would not work without it. I am a big fan. I still have a lot to learn. Um, I always wish I had Alan Minton's brain um, when it comes to, you know, non solution non-ideality and light scattering and, and all of that. I don't. Um, <laughs> so, but, but yes, it is a, it's a, it, it, it yeah, it's a, it's a go-to. I'll say it like that. Thank you very much. Steve, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, it's, I'm, I look at, um, biophysical characterization, especially I had quite a few years in formulation development, and I tried to explain it to folks is that uh, while we've talked about the side where you're a detective in troubleshooting, putting on your firefighter hat, what you're really doing is you're you're writing a novel or you're painting a picture. And I, I take it more to the artistic side of doing uh, analytical work to determine what the end result is. You know, imagine a great masterpiece of art that's just missing red, and you know something's wrong. And it's that point where, you know, we're all, the panelists are, are obviously classically trained biophysical scientists, that what you have to know is not just what the technique gives you, but you have to know what its limitations are. And so what you have is you combine these things together, what like Catherine was saying is that, you know, each protein is unique. And we're getting into the realm of where we have, we're not just doing MABs anymore. We're doing 
enzymes, we're doing uh, inhibitors, we're doing all forms of biophysical structure. And each of those pictures is going to be different. And you want to make sure that um, we had mentioned, I heard was mentioned something like uh, circular dichroism, NMR, and uh, also fluorescence. But the advantage of using any one of these techniques is also understanding its limitations. And so to that end, what you need to do is come up with something that works within the time frame of your project. I can't spend you know, a month running a detailed NMR analysis. I have to use some you know, abbreviated technique, or I have to just look at the amide region or and and hope that consistently across multiple samples, I'm getting the same sensitivity in the amide region, depending upon what day I'm running the NMR. So it comes down to is understanding those limitations and making sure that you're uh, filling those gaps. Now, the biggest gap that we've had going forward across my career is that is the secondary structure analysis is that all these techniques take so much time and they're not absolute methods you have your biophysicists who paint pictures but you have your traditional analytically trained scientists who deal in absolutes and that's where you have to cross that gap you have to come up with a characterization method like the redshift ir system that will deliver an absolute deconvoluted structure analysis, which you can then build uh, specifications around. This is really the step in moving forward and in truly integrating all four levels of protein structure into a submission for a drug product. So you, you can choose whatever methods that you prefer, um, but in the end, what you have to come back to if you're a trained biophysical chemist is you have to address all four of those levels. Thank you, beautifully said, really appreciate it. Before I move on to another question, does anyone else want to respond or add anything else? Because the conversation evolved a little bit, which, which I think is great, but does anyone else want to add anything to it or shall we step on to another slightly different topic? Um, I just want to add something very quickly to what Steven said. Um, you know, when it boils down to it, um, you've got to release drug substance. You have to release drug product. Um, and so your analytical methods are key, but some of these biophysical techniques aren't amenable to a QC environment. So what I encourage uh, and something that I'm passionate about um, is when people are developing these analytical methods to tell the story of what's going on um, in, for a molecule, maybe it's on GNP stability or you need to do release, is allow the biophysical tools to help you interpret the analytical data. Um, so if you're using more classical techniques that are QC friendly, allow, like SEC, for example, allow the biophysical methods to inform you of what your SEC is actually telling you. Um, just a quick example, we had a protein where it looked like it had a huge amount of high molecular weight species. What it was, though, it was a conformational isomer. Um, so just really using um, using the bio, the biophysical techniques to just walk along uh, with those classical analytical developments. To redirect a little bit, when you're considering bringing a new technology or a new technique or a new tool into your lab how, or, or yeah, into your lab or recommending it to somebody else, how do you decide if it's a good fit for, for your needs, for the needs of your customers, for the needs of the molecules that you're looking at? And uh, Mary, just like, if you want to do a talk about from a regulatory perspective, how you might introduce that to the FDA or how you might recommend your your, your clients introduce a new technology to the FDA so they understand both the strengths and the limitations of that technology. I think it was Steve who commented that you've got to understand what a technique is good at and also perhaps what a technique is less, less good at. So how do you weigh and balance those various things when considering a new technique or a new tool for your lab? 
Yeah, sure. I'm happy to comment on that. Um, so FDA, you know, they've got to kind of balance two things. Like from my time there, I know that like everyone is a hardcore scientist and they are passionate about patients and, um, you know, finding new and different ways to bring products to market that are safe and effective faster, right? That's their number one goal. It's never their goal to slow down or bog the system or, you know, be too attached to old things. Um, that being said, you know, while they want to encourage new um, state-of-the-art techniques to be incorporated into product development and manufacturing, um, they want to make sure that the understanding of the method is, is at such a place that you can implement it seamlessly and not impact the end product, right? So a lot of times what you'll see is um, FTA will ask you to run your method in parallel. Sorry, backing up for a second. So you, you've got to come with a lot of data first, right? If it, especially if it's a brand new method no one's ever used before, then you've got to come with a, a good data package to show that you understand how the method works and, and how to read, read and interpret the data and also teach that to FDA, right? And then once you've gotten them to a place where they're comfortable with you starting to use it, they'll probably ask you to run it in parallel with your old method for a while, um, even if you've already perform some kind of like comparability between the two methods to show that they, they give you similar data or maybe the new one gives you better data. Um, and yeah, so they'll probably ask you to run it in parallel for a while just to make sure that, you know, you're confirming what you thought you knew from the start, that the method is either the same or better. And kind of as an, an add-on to that, you know, there's various pathways at um, at FDA where you can get early feedback if you're trying to do something like this. In CEDAR, there's the ETT, um, Emerging Technology Team. You can request meetings with the FDA to kind of share with them what you're trying to do, brainstorm with them. They're very open. They'll give you feedback on that. Um, and for CBER, they have um, similar meetings. They're called CAT meetings. So these are... Um, avenues for you to get feedback on novel um, CMC and analytical technique kind of things that you're, you're trying to implement. Great. I appreciate that. It's refreshing to hear that the FDA is evolving and learning and likes to hear about new techniques that may add certain value over traditional tools that are already being used. Anyone else care to make a comment about new tools in your lab and how you decide what, what, what deserves space on the bench and what doesn't deserve that precious bench space? So sometimes to, to kind of use a, a pop term, sometimes you just have to hoist the Jolly Roger and essentially tell your team that you know that this technology is going to add value. Sometimes it's just pertinent, it's, it's good risk taking to bring in new technology that when you're trying to solve recurring issues, you just have to be you know, transparent and frank with your team and say, we, we keep coming to this issue again and again. We need the new technology in the laboratory to solve those issues. That's probably not, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend that as your first avenue in bringing new technology into the laboratory. You're still gonna have to do your cost benefit analysis and explain to your team, you know, why you want to bring it in. That's, you know, your more traditional process. I got you. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, Catherine, please. Sorry, I would agree uh, with Stephen. And and my take home message is let the data speak for itself. Um, beta test these instruments. Create case studies. Um, of how this data either um, augments your current data set or allows you to see the molecules in a different way and it enriches your decision-making process. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to ask a company, let me beta test this instrument and I wanna run it through its paces. You know, if you've got a lot of different molecules or formulations, uh, put it in there and, um, and just see how it marries up with the rest of your data. And if you can make a case for it, that's the way to do it. And you can present that to, like for me, potential clients. Great. And just also from the, the CDMO perspective, do you more regularly find your clients 
asking you for certain tools or is there some openness for you to say, hey, I, I really love, you, you gave a great dirge on malls before. I really love malls. We have to run malls or what, what it might, how, how do you, how does that work with your various clients? Um, you know, I try to take a very um, humble team approach. I know what I like, I know what methods I like to use, and I know what those methods, to, to my, my ability, I still have so much to learn, of uh, how powerful these methods are. So I try to use a team approach. I try to educate the client on what a particular assay could offer. If they bring in assays I'm not quite as big of a fan on, um, I go ahead and say, let them know why I'm not a fan of it, but let's try it and let's compare it to another technique. And again, at the end of the day, let the science tell a story. Perfect. I appreciate that. Thank you. Risto, do you want to add any comments? Yeah, so uh, probably for us, it's a bit different because we have a higher energy barrier to, to buying new devices <laughs> in the university. So uh, for us, it should be really added value. And not only for one group, but for a group of researchers uh, in order to you know, explain why, why you have to spend money on a new device. And then in addition to that, maybe I'm more unconventional, but I really also look for things like uh, robustness, even some degree of automation in the lab, because uh, I think we are a bit used to this thinking of, yes, there are PhD students, you know, they will run the samples, but it is so much easier when you have a robust method and it just gives good results with different operators and uh, you don't need somebody who is um, pipetting for a year or two and preparing samples and cleaning cuvettes in order to, to get good data. I mean, there is also charm to this, I, I must admit. I also appreciate instruments that are robust, automated, give you quick and, and reliable data. Just to ask a quick follow-up on it, as you do have to be a little bit more cautious with, with the research dollars in the academic space, is it, do you find it more valuable to add a totally new tool or technique which gives a completely different um, answer or biophysical attribute, or do you sometimes upgrade from a more classical tool to uh, a newer technique, which gives you either better reliability or, as you said, robustness over those other tools? Because it's, I guess, two different perspectives about how to add, add new toys to your toolbox. So I think the easiest way to, to get a new instrument is if one of your workhorse instruments in the lab breaks down. I think then it's, it's pretty easy to, to explain and then to even upgrade to the next model. Uh, upgrading an, an instrument is anyway running and, and it's giving good results for us in the university is usually not uh, not feasible. But now adding a new analytical method, like being able to measure something new where people see benefit in it and they can see they can address new research questions or uh, measure now uh, different things for their samples, uh, this is valuable as well. Perfect. Thank you. I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much for all of those wonderful and well-thought-out responses. I'm looking forward to the live Q&A that's going to follow. Thank you. Great discussion, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to share all of your wonderful insights with the Gen audience. We really appreciate that. Uh, that said, to the audience... Q&A is coming up in just a moment. So if you have a question for our panelists, now is the time to send it in. All you need to do is type your question into the Ask a Question box and hit submit. All right. Looks like we have a bunch of questions already, so let's get started. Bear with us for just a moment as we make the transition into the Q&A. All right, everyone, thanks so much for joining us for the Q&A session. We have a bunch of questions that have come in, so uh, please continue to send those in so we can try to get to as many of them as we can. I'm going to turn things over to Dave now. Uh, he's going to run the Q&A session for today. So, Dave, over to you. Thanks. I'd like to thank all the panelists for a great discussion. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for all the great questions. Really appreciate it. They've been pouring in. We'll now trans over, transition over to that first question. So for the panelists and whoever wants to answer, please just go ahead. 
If you're analyzing a biomolecule with two orthogonal techniques and they give slightly conflicting or even contradictory results, how do you go about resolving those differences or determining which, which answer is the more appropriate answer to go with? This is Catherine. I can take that if you would like me to, Dave. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, first and foremost, um, ensure that you understand what your two assays are actually measuring. Something that comes to mind in orthogonal techniques is aggregates um, and um, detecting them with light scattering or subvisible particle analysis. What you have to make sure of is that um, if the technique is truly orthogonal in a case like that, that you're looking at methods that are looking at soluble versus insoluble aggregation. Because if the two methods are looking at two different aspects, um, you can definitely count on getting different results. The second part of that answer would be is to understand the stability indicating power of that, those methods. So really do some force degradation of your molecules. See how each method changes um, as your molecule becomes um, unstabilized. And uh, really lean on the one um, that it tends to give you uh, the more, more enriched Great. Thanks, Catherine. Anyone else want to add anything else to that question? Hey, it's um, it's Mary, and I totally agree with everything Catherine said. Just to kind of add that, um, you know, the other thing you want to look into is um, making sure that your methods that you're using are suitable for what you're trying to um, use them for. And then also make sure that the controls you're using when you're running the methods um, make sense for what you're trying to do and that the results from those controls um, came out as you anticipated as well. Great. Thanks, Mary. We can move along to the next question. Uh, next really interesting question. It says, a very common problem for proteins needing refolding is assessing refolding efficiency concentrations low and often a large number of recipients are present, what methods would you suggest, especially for rapid assessment of refolding efficiency? Anybody care to respond? Thank you. Can you hear me? Chris is speaking. Yes. Um, I can take this on it. It's a very good question. So I guess the most efficient way to screen for refolding conditions for your protein is to divide it into a few steps. So I guess the first question would be whether the conditions you're testing are resulting in soluble protein because there will be also a lot of precipitation after refolding. And after you find conditions where you, you have mostly soluble protein, the next question would be, whether this protein is in the right oligomeric state, right? Usually this would be a monomer. So I think uh, size exclusion chromatography is very efficient at, at this point to screen the samples. And when you find where your protein is, is soluble and in the right oligomeric state, it is crucial to verify that it's in the right structure yeah, because proteins can also misfold. So there you would need a technique where you can quickly look into the secondary structure, compare it to a reference, and uh, eventually, at the end, you would like to confirm the biological activity or, or binding to a target. Uh, so by using like this funnel approach, where you start with, with very fast techniques like UV, VIS, and SEC, and then you move to a, a techniques that, that would require a bit more time, I think uh, you would be efficient in, in finding conditions to refold the protein. Thank you, Risto. Anyone else care to add anything to that one? Okay, happy to move along to the next question then. Uh, this question says, we've always struggled with aggregate formation. Is assessment using multi-angle dynamic light scattering and tunable resistive pulse sensing adequate to characterize the aggregates 
in a quantitative manner? Who would like to tackle that question? I can at least start to tackle this question. Um, you know, with aggregates, uh, you know, you got to make sure that um, you're truly defining what you're looking for. Are you looking for soluble aggregates, higher order structures that, that don't form subvisible particles? Or are you also um, looking for subvisible particles? So soluble aggregates that then lead to subvisible particles. So it really comes down to making sure that um, you are using techniques um, that are made for looking at soluble aggregation, reversible aggregation um, versus subvisible um, particles. Um, so I am not um, familiar with tunable resistive pulse sensing. Um, MALS is going to be soluble aggregation, uh, higher order structures, um, and then other things um, such as uh, BMI and MFI and HIAC. Um, those kind of methods are going to be looking at um, insoluble. Um, so I hope that kind of answered the question. Um, but basically, I think that at the end of the day, uh, when you're dealing with aggregate formation, um, make sure that you are looking in both the soluble and the insoluble realm. Great. Thank you. Anyone else care to add anything along to that question? Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is Mary. Um, I'm not sure if this question was asked in the first, like what perspective it was for, but if you're characterizing and monitoring aggregates um, for drug development and you're thinking about what to submit into a submission, um, I would say that, you know, in general, health authorities don't have like um, favorite assays or preferred assays or anything like that. Um, there are like a number of standard assays that lots of people use and they're familiar with seeing those data. Um, and Catherine mentioned a number of those. Um, those are a little bit easier to submit the data for because everyone's comfortable and familiar with um, how to interpret the data. Um, but that being said, it doesn't mean that you can't use different assays. You just have to take the responsibility of um, justifying that the assay is suitable for what you're trying to do. So <clears throat> again, kind of in line with what Catherine was saying, you know, that means understanding what you're looking for um, and then understanding how the the method works and making sure that, that you know, everything makes sense that way. Um, and also, of course, preparing the narrative so that you can convince someone at um, the health authority um, that uh, that your method is suitable for what you're trying to do. Great, thanks. Anyone else? If not, we'll move right along. Our next question is focused on formulations and modes of action. It says, formulation comes when? During the drug discovery process? Is it before MOA, after MOA, or is it a little bit of both? Who would like to make a, make a few comments on that question? Hi, this is Steve. Um, having done formulation, I've actually been part of projects where uh, MOA has not been known till later in the CMC development process. So, um, it, in my opinion, um, you know, locking down a formulation or settling on a, a primary formulation. Uh, typically isn't linked to the MOA. Um, it's always good to know your MOA as early as possible. Um, that that assists in a lot of your uh, selection of assays going forward, uh, which then you know feeds into you know understanding your formulations. But uh, typically, uh, you know the the overall stability. Uh, is linked to your formulation, while you know the the PKPD is more relevant to the MOA. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Anyone else care to add anything on to that? Um, this is Catherine. Steve, I really, really liked your answer. Um, I think it is important to not lock 
those formulations in too early. I think the thing, one thing that I wanted to say is that the methods that we've been talking about today in terms of personality assessment and biophysical characterization, when you are selecting molecules um, to then transition into biopharmaceuticals, use these tools early um, and look at your developability um, of, of a particular molecule. Uh, it's going to have to go through a lot um, to make it um, into a drug product. So don't be, even though if you're not doing directly formulation development, don't be afraid to look at these molecules from a developability perspective um, early in the process before you select your top candidates to move forward. Because after you do that, it gets really easy. Great, thank you. We can move on to the next question now. Uh, the next question came in is, how do we improve half-life of an antibody which is used for therapeutics? And maybe if I could, I'm just going to tag another, another follow-up question onto that in terms of, and that is, what type of characterization or recharacterization might need to be done after any chemical or additional modifications are done from a half-life perspective? Who would like to maybe comment on that one? Yeah, this, this is Steve again. Um, typically, when you're looking at selecting antibodies, you know, in your maturation process, you'll find that uh, half-life can be a selection criteria uh, along with potency. Um, uh, uh, so there's selecting there. There's also uh, traditionally, there's been a number of products on the market where pegylation of a, a, a protein uh, assists in uh, increasing or improving the half-life of a molecule. Um, but, you know, it, it's really, um, to your point, what, you know, how do you analyze for it? Um, my experience is that um, folks typically just look to see if they have adequate potency after, um, it, it, this is especially important for pegylation. Um, but the issue comes in that if pegylation strongly disrupts your structure, um, you know, you're, you're going to want to analyze for that because you in, accidentally may uh, develop like neutralizing antibodies um, to a very foreign structure. Great, thank you, Steve. Anyone else care to add on? Yeah, this is Christo. Maybe I can add on, on the antibodies. I think it is also very typical that you introduce mutations in the AFC part. So these mutations normally improve the binding to the neonatal receptor. And there are also some products on the market, antibody products with engineered FC for extended half-life nowadays. But uh, the challenge is that these mutations that increase half-life um, also negatively affect sometimes the stability of the FC. That's why it's uh, very important that you then characterize very well uh, degradation structure and, and all the other um, attributes which will be important Great, thank you, Risto. Moving along to the next question. How do we incorporate multiple technologies for characterization and confirmation of stability as molecules move from drug substance to drug product and then all the way to the fill finish process? Who would like to kick us off? Uh, Dave, I can start on this one. Um, forgive me if you hear my dogs in the background. Um, so, you know, early in the process of, of drug development for a protein molecule, you really, you really have the ability um, to throw everything in the kitchen sink at it if you have those technologies on hand. And you're really gathering as much information as you can about the personality of that molecule, its structure, its stability, what it's sensitive to, as you develop the process and get it ready for uh, clinical trials. Um, where 
as you get closer to the drug product and fill finish, um, that then becomes a very GMP type activity um, where some of these biophysical techniques are a little bit difficult to move into um, um, a GM. It's not impossible, but it can be challenging to move some of these into a GMP environment. What we, what I suggest um, is that if uh, you know what your protein is going to go through um, in any of the processes re related to uh, drug product um, and cell finish, is to set up mock studies to expose your formulation to those specific stressors. Use your um, biophysical tools to understand um, if there are any changes uh, that are happening and then try to correlate those changes with those analytical methods that are GMP friendly. Thank you. Hi. Anyone else want to add on? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is, this is Steve. Um, and another example I can think of is if you're going through, you know, some of your, your stages of development and you know, you come across uh, CQA risk, critical quality assessment risk that, um, you know, you're going to choose based on that, you're going to choose the best assay you have to mitigate that risk. But sometimes uh, you may not have a best assay and you're, you're not mitigating that risk and you may need to look at uh, novel alternate technologies and as previously mentioned, build in enough studies to uh, generate enough data to show that that new technique you're introducing later uh, mitigates the risk. Great, thank you very much. I think we've only got time for one more question here. And it was a really basic question. I think I'm gonna take it. The question was, what is Structure Matters and how do I learn more about Structure Matters? This, this webinar was sponsored by Structure Matters, and Structure Matters is a consortium of biophysical instrument providers and technologies, and we're all focused on, in general, improving biophysical and physical chemical characterization of proteins and peptides and biomolecules. So please, to learn more about the consortium, visit us at structure-matters.com. And I think that's the last question we have time for today, so I'll turn it back to Jeff. All right. Thanks so much, Dave. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on the GEN website at genengnews.com for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again or feel free to forward the link to any of your friends and colleagues who you think might be interested. I'd like to thank all the presenters again for their very informative presentations and discussions. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention and very thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Structure Matters and Redshift Bio for sponsoring this webinar. Hopefully, we'll see you again at another Gen webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Everyone stay safe and healthy.